أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله أستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا من يهده لا فلا مدلة ومن يدلل فلا هادية وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له أز وجاء وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساعة من يتئل ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يأسهما فإن لا يدر إلا نفسه ولا يدور لها شيئا عما بعد فقال الله تعالى في القرآن الكريم في سورة البقرة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام ميم ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه للمتقين الذين يكملون بالغيب ويقيمون الصلاة ومما رزقناهم ينفقون والذين يكملون بما أنزل إليك وما أنزل من قبلك وبلا قيرتهم يكلون أولئك على هدى من ربهم وأولئك هم المفلحون وصدق الله العظيم بارك الله لي ولكم في القرآن الكريم ونفعني وإياكم بالذكر الحكيم إنه هو جواد رؤوف رحيم الآن حي ترجم I seek refuge in Allah from Satan, from Shaitan, the accursed devil. In the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate, all praise is due to Allah, all gratitude is due to Allah. I seek his help and beg his forgiveness. And we seek refuge in Allah from the mischief and the evils of our souls. Whomsoever Allah guides, there is none who can lead that person astray. And whomsoever Allah guides, there is, and whomsoever Allah permits or causes to go astray, there is none to guide them. I bear witness that there is no God, no deity, worthy of worship or existing other than Allah, glory be to him, who is one alone and unique without partner or associate. And I bear witness further that Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, is Allah's servant, messenger, and apostle. And he, Allah, has sent his messenger in truth and with the truth as a bearer of glad tidings and also as a warner in advance of the hour of judgment. Therefore, whomsoever obeys Allah and his messenger, surely that person is rightly guided, and whomsoever disobeys the two of them, surely that person harms only his or her own soul. And they harm not Allah the slightest little bit, as for what follows. For Allah, glory be to him, has said in the Quran in the first five ayat, the first five verses of the second surah of the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, the cow, in the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate. Alif, Lam, Me. This is the book. This is the scripture in which there is no doubt. It is a guidance for the God conscious who believe in the unseen establish Salah and spend in charity out of what we have provided for their sustenance. Who believe in this revelation which is sent to you, meaning sent to you, O Muhammad, and the revelations which were sent before you, and firmly believe in the hereafter. They are on true guidance from their up 
true guidance from their Lord, and they are the ones who will attain salvation. They are the ones who will achieve success. And surely Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, glorified and exalted be he, has spoken the truth. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam, the clock is ticking and the special time of the year approaches and approaches quickly. It is now just a matter of days, a few days, before that special season will occur. When we watch the weather reports, when there is about to be a change in season, the meteorologists will say, uh, we expect spring, so-and-so day. So-and-so day is the first day of winter. So-and-so day, just a couple of days, first day of fall, first day of summer, etc. And those are physical seasons. Seasons that are part of the physical signs of Allah. However, verily, there are spiritual seasons as well. Spiritual times of the year that come in at a certain time and that go out at a certain time. Spiritual times of the year that have their own uh, activity, just as the physical times of the year have their own activity. The activities of summer are not the activities of winter. The activities of fall are not the activities of the springtime. Each season has its own activity, has its own food, has its own uh, clothing. And so it is with the spiritual seasons. And we are now just a few days away from the end of the spiritual season of Shaban. And before that was the spiritual season of Rajab, the month of Rajab, the month of Shaban. These are special <laughs> times of the year. That's why I've labored to remind you of this and inform you of this. You listen to my speech on Yama Juma, I say, this is the month of Rajab. This is the month of Shaban. Why? Because we must be aware of the seasons. And you're not going to be able to turn on the television and somebody else tell you that. We have to remind one another. And the month of Shaban is the month of preparation for the sacred month of Ramadan. And so the spiritual season of rest and renewal for the soul approaches. The spiritual season for inner reorientation approaches. The spiritual season for psycho-spiritual uh, uh, realignment approaches. Let me back up a second. I've described Ramadan as a spiritual season of rest and renewal for the soul. And as a matter of fact, really, Ramadan is a month of rest and renewal for the body as well. Because we eat less during Ramadan, at least we're supposed to. And when you spend less time filling your stomach, and therefore causing your stomach to have to work in order to digest the food. Some of us have our stomachs working overtime, all the time. But during the month of Ramadan, we cut down on the amount of food that we consume, and therefore this gives the body 
then specifically this stomach, stomach, and I hope you know many uh, diseases begin and end with the stomach. And so Ramadan is a time when the stomach is given a little rest. And it is the time certainly when the soul rests. Mu'allimi Shaykh Alama Tawfiq Rahmatullah Arehi, the founding Imam of this Jamaat, of our Jamaat, of our community, of our congregation. He used to say to those of us who were his students, when the stomach feasts, the soul fasts. And when the stomach fasts, the soul feasts. When you are denying your stomach, that gives the soul a chance to feast. That gives us the soul a chance to eat. People always wonder, man, why do we live in such a spiritually bankrupt society? Well, one of the reasons is that people are constantly stuffing their stomachs to excess. Here in America, people throw away more food than people eat in other countries. This is one of the few countries where you can walk down almost any block and there's an abundance of places to eat. Some blocks, it doesn't matter where you are in, in the city. Some blocks, all you have to do is turn the corner and there's one place after another, restaurants, snack bars, juice bars, and depending on what time of the day it is, they might all be filled at the same time. So people spend so much time stuffing their stomachs and very little time feeding their souls. Oh, you who believe, how, how is the soul fed? How do you give your soul food to eat and to drink? You give your soul food to eat and to drink by fasting. You give your soul food to eat and to drink through prayer. Prayer is a food and a drink for the soul. Being charitable, giving, is food and drink for the soul. Remembrance of Allah is food and drink for the soul. Recitation from the word of Allah and dhikr, those things are food, drink, and nourishment for the soul. So the spiritual season that approaches is one of rest and renewal. It is one of inner reorientation and psycho-spiritual realignment. What do I mean by that? This uh, uh, principle is demonstrated for us on an almost daily basis through, uh, if this was the old days, if we were back in the 20th century, I would say, you know, it's demonstrated through the use of a compass. Now it's demonstrated through the GPS. If you have your GPS on, whether you're walking, riding, or driving, or being driven, as you go from point A to point B in the highways and byways of man, you find your GPS constantly realigning itself in order to guide you in the direction that you need to go to, to uh, uh, reach your destination. So your GPS will tell you turn right, turn left, take this service road, etc., etc. If, for those of you who are familiar with a compass, if you have a compass in your hand and you're traveling, you constantly see the needle turning this way and that way, sometimes by small degrees, sometimes by large degrees. Why? Because the, the uh, needle on the compass is designed to always point northward. It points northward, the needle on the 
compass and people who know about directions and maps and that sort of thing, they know that if you're facing north and you put your hand out to the right, that that's east. Put your hand out to the left and that's west. And if you're traveling northward, you know behind you is south. Why, why do I mention that? Because I said Ramadan is a time of re- orientation. Orient means eastward. That's what, that's what it means. Reorientation means realignment in an eastwardly direction. As we travel the highways and byways of the life of this world during any given year, if we would live lives of obedience to Allah, then our journey requires constant reorientation. We'll constantly uh, uh, have to be guided, turn right, turn left, stop, go, rest for, for a moment, else you become fatigued, else you become lost. When you get lost, regardless of whether you're walking or, or driving, when you're lost, the first thing you have to do is stop and reorientate yourself. <coughs> oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I took a, long, I took a wrong turn here. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait, wait, where, where am I? Oh, I'm here. I should be going there. So, so it is with the soul. So it is with the mind. As we journey through life, we're constantly distracted constantly turning this way and that way. We have moments when we get lost. We have moments when we become disoriented. Oh, oh, uh, what am I supposed to be doing? Where, where, where am I supposed to be? What direction am I supposed to be going in? Uh, because we know from what Allah says to us in the Quran that we come from him and we return to him. But in between that coming and that going, you can really get lost, man. You could, you could be on the right path. What is the right path? That said, all oh, tell them, we'll stuck in. You could be on the right path. Everything is going well. You say, well, man, if the angel of death comes for me right now, he's going to catch me on the right path. And then the next thing you know, you're taking a wrong turn somewhere. Next thing you know, you, you've lost your orientation, and so you must realign yourself. Ramadan is that time. Ramadan is the time if we are true to the disciplines of the sacred month, then we will find our hearts, we will find our wills, we will find our desires being realigned. So be mindful. Be mindful of the coming spiritual season and make your preparations. This kutbah is intended as an encouragement for sacred month preparations. People who organize their lives when they want to organize their lives and keep their lives organized in order to achieve a goal in order to reach the point of destination in their journey, in order to make sure that they are um, completing their tasks, they form what's called a checklist. They say, oh yeah, okay, Dad, this is my checklist. A, B, C, one, two, three. And then every time they accomplish a task on their checklist, they check it off. Okay, this is done. Let me go on to the next one. Why do I mention that? I mention that, dear brothers and sisters, in order to encourage you and to encourage myself to have a checklist that constitutes our sacred month preparation. Don't just walk, you know, walk around through Hayat dunya walking around, you know, through the life of this world. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be Ramadan. Uh, any, any day now without making preparation 
Prepare yourself. The prophet, alayhi salam was salat, he used the month of Shaban for the purpose of preparing for Ramadan. How did he do it? He did it by constantly fasting throughout the month of Shaban. You've heard me remind you that Aisha, radiallahu anha, Aisha, our mother in Deen, may Allah's favor be upon her. She, you know, she, well, we have more ahadith from Aisha describing the personal, intimate behavior of the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salam wa salat, than any of the other Sahaba or Sahabiyat. She was his wife. She knew him from when she was a young girl. So she had a whole lifetime of watching him, of being in his presence. And so when you study the ahadith of Aisha, we just finished a class uh, about a month ago. We finished a class in which we were studying the 40 ahadith of Aisha, radiallahu anha. And so when you read and study the ahadith of Aisha, bint Abi Bak, radiallahu anha, you see the personal behavior of Allah's messenger on display. And she, in watching him, she, she, she said, well, he used to fast more during the month of Shaban than any other month except for Ramadan, she said. But Ramadan is the month after Shaban. So from that, we learned the principle of preparing. We have to prepare ourselves for the coming of the sacred month, O oh, you who believe. So let's, let's look at a couple of quick checklist items. <clears throat> Item number one on the checklist, cleanliness of environment. Some people, do, do you know that cleanliness is a form of worship? And there are people who regard cleanliness as worship. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, At-tuhur shatrul iman, he said. Uh, cleanliness is part of faith. In the English language, we, we have just saying cleanliness is next to godliness. Faith is related to worship. Cleanliness is a form of worship. So as part of our preparation for Ramadan, we should start cleaning up. For those, for those people who live a life of cleanliness as worship, they know, for instance, that when the seasons change, that that's an occasion for cleaning. <laughs> I don't know if they still practicing this stuff. This is this is the old school wisdom. Now, they you know they didn't just let the season change. They say, ah, like right now, say time for spring cleaning. And you see them going through the house. If the house is already clean, they give it a little extra buff. If things are already in order, they go through and make sure there's there's. You know, things are in order. I used to be married to somebody like that. You know, she used to clean so much it would make people nervous, including me. <laughs> because she couldn't stand to see anything out of place. And then one day I was walking in a spiritual conscious bookstore and I looked on the shelf and there was a book, Cleanliness as Worship. And I said, SubhanAllah, I bought the book took it home to my wife at that time, Rahmatullah Adeha, and she looked in the book, she was looking in the book, she sat down, and I could hear her saying, I knew it. <laughs> yeah, and I told her, you could have written that book, right? She said, yeah, I could have written this book. Because cleanliness is related to worship. So people who are clean and orderly and neat, they do even more so. Listen, I'm not from New York, I'm from the South. I come from an environment where people used to sweep dirt. You know, we have like the front yard, and, and, and if you didn't have grass growing, there was dirt. And I used to watch my grandparents 
And I didn't just watch because my grandmother would give me the broom and say, sweep that dirt. Sweet, you know, and I'm living up north, so I'm like, sweep the dirt? How, how can you do that? It's already dirty. And she used to say, the difference between dirty and dirt. And she used to go get some water and make me pour it on the dust and sweep the dust, get, the, <laughs> get that dust in order. And that's relevant, you know, because some of us, our homes look like that. Our apartments, we haven't done a spring cleaning since 1902. You know, so, but Ramadan is coming now, and it's coming in the springtime. So go home and clean your domicile. Clean your living place. We, we had already started here in the masjid as a reflection of that. Now all you have to do is that we already shampooed the, the carpet, changed the curtains. These are not the same curtains that were up several weeks ago. It's different curtains now. Why? Because we're getting prepared for the sacred month. And certainly we should do the same thing personally. I was out with a brother the other day, Muslim brothers, you know, we stop in to uh, have lunch. And so uh, we ordered something, some food. And so the brother said uh, he ordered some coffee to drink. And uh, so the, the, the waitress said, how many sugars? He said, no sugar. So then when the waitress walked away, another brother at the table who was very good friends with him, and he said, since when you don't put sugar in your coffee, man? I watch you, you always putting three and four teaspoons. He said, yeah, I know, but Ramadan is coming. And I have to 